Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Karen Carboner, and I am the president and a founding board member of the Walt Whitman Initiative, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission it is to celebrate New York City's literary legacy. We're an organizing center for all sorts of cultural activism and poetry related events, just like the one that you're gonna enjoy tonight. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and tune into our YouTube channel to explore more presentations in our robust American Love Speaker series. And if you like what we're doing, there are many ways to support our programs and initiatives. Please visit our website to find out how or write to walt at waltwhitmaninitiative.org. That's right, that's walt at waltwhitmaninitiative.org. We decided to offer the speaker series, note the word speaker, not lecture, to present timely public facing conversations on Walt Whitman's life, work and legacy. You'll hear conversations and enjoy presentations by teachers, poets, graduate students, artists like today, printers, neighborhood activists, you name it. These are not designed to be academic talks, but free, open, informal discussions that we end by inviting your questions for Q&A with our speakers. So if you're watching this live on YouTube, please make sure that you post your questions in the chat section and we'll try to get to them at the end of the show. And if you miss one of our events, you can always catch them on our Whitman Initiative YouTube channel, okay? And at our uh, website, waltwhitmaninitiative.org, you can find our calendar of uh, presentations that were already given and the ones that are coming up. Um, I just wanna highlight the next two that are coming up. We have a lot of fantastic talks and I hope you all are able to join us again. Next week, we have a Whitman Initiative member, Ted Widmer, who's going to come along and give a talk called When Whitman Saw Lincoln. Um, I'm sure some of you out there know that Ted has come out with a smash hit book on Lincoln called Lincoln on the Verge, a, a very well-reviewed book. We're really excited for Ted uh, about the book and also really excited to host a conversation with him. So please tune in next week. I'm the lucky one who's gonna be able to talk back with Ted about Lincoln on the Verge. So that's October 8th. October 15th, we have a special presentation of the resurrected 1944 radio play, Walt Whitman. So Norman Corwin was a genius of American radio drama. Bernard Herrmann was Her Hollywood's supreme film composer. Some of you might remember him from Psycho, Citizen Kane, North by Northwest, Vertigo, and et cetera. Um, so in 1944, Herman and Corwin got together to create a classic radio drama called Walt Whitman to rally the home front during World War II with an appeal to the ideals of de American democracy. So the script was culled from Leaves of Grass and there was a new recording made by Post Classical Ensemble. Actually, it's out on, it's going to be released by, on, on Naxos, N-A-X-O-S, on October 9th. So we're hosting uh, a presentation about that radio play, make sure you catch the pr premiere, the world premiere on October 9th at the Noxo site. Also the post-classical ensemble site, that's the group that actually recorded and are releasing that. So very exciting, very excited to release these two events and also absolutely thrilled tonight to host Robust American Love Avid Fis Visions by Walt Whitman and John Ransom Phillips. Um, I wanna welcome my dear friend, John Ransom Phillips to the show. Hey there, John. Um, can you see me? There you are, you are, you are live. We're, we're sharing the screen and uh, John is a friend, but also um, if you have looked at our website, we actually named our, our speaker series after his own art, Robust American Love, Avid Visions by Walt Whitman and John Ransom Phillips was an exhibition last year at Black Book Presents in Dumbo, Brooklyn. Uh, it's a series of 30 watercolor illuminations of provocative Whitman quotations. So we will be talking about those and much more with John tonight. I just wanna introduce him 
just a bit before we get to uh, speaking with him. Um, artists don't die, uh, John writes. Uh, I invade artists' dreams and invite them to talk with me. His lifelong dialogue with Whitman is represented by Robust American Love, a series of 30 watercolor illuminations of quotations from the poet's best known works, as well as obscure sources. Written in Philip's easy hand, devoid of quotation marks and freed from their original poetic form, these meditations become Philip's as much as they are Whitman's. Alive and elastic, their words harmonize naturally with Philip's provocative illuminations. Learn about the intimate bond between poet and artist as Philip's today discusses Whitman's influence on his work with me. Um, I'm the I was the curator of this show in Brooklyn. Very pleased to work with John and the staff at Black Book Presents, a, a really fabulous uh, gallery on, right on the waterfront in Dumbo, Brooklyn. A bit about John now. John Ransom Phillips is a New York-based contemporary artist who works across various mediums, painting, film, theater, and poetry. His paintings combine image and text, nodding to the legacy of symbolism, in that they demand the spectator unpack them with careful consideration for what they portray beyond appearances. Mr. Phillips received his BA and PhD in art history from the University of Chicago and a BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. He's got an amazing website, which I urge you to check out, John Ransom Phillips, 2Ls1P.com. And you will get a, um, a wonderful multimedia look at this incredible artist's work. And as I said, he's worked in film, He's worked in theater. Uh, he is a poet. He is a writer and a painter. So um, I feel like today, John, we can talk about that, this transition between mediums, uh, because you have spent uh, a great deal of time with Walt Whitman and bringing Walt Whitman to other sensory uh, experiences for people who enjoy your work. Um, I also want to say here that John has published several magnificent books, and I had to pick my favorites, so you probably know this, John. I love Ransoming Matthew Brady, which is an exploration of the career of that half-blind, timid photographer who I guess most people know for his portraits or his Civil War photographs. Uh, just a, an incredible book of John's work with commentary. Um, and then I will also have to put in a word for going forth by day, journeys into the book of the dead, which is John's re-envisionment of that ancient Egyptian funerary text, the book of the dead. He's got about a hundred watercolors in this book that were done on papyrus and they're accompanied by his contemporary thoughts and ruminations. So not unlike the robust American love series in that John is making this unique transfer from one place in time to another. Um, he has a book coming out and it sounds like John, this book is coming out in January, which I'm sorry about that. It should be now, right? With the election uh, at hand, it's called Sleeping Presidents. And if you all are interested, you can pre-order the book on Amazon right now. Um, it looks, Amazing, John. I only saw the PDF that you sent and, and got to sort of scroll through it. But John basically has highlighted and explored the dreams of all uh, American presidents from Trump back down to George Washington. So it's political, it's artistic, um, it's philosophical. And I, I don't know another work like it. It's, it's enormous and generous. So I'm looking forward to talking to John about that new work. Um, so we've got a lot on our plates here talking about an artist who is very accomplished. And John, I thought that maybe I would begin with Walt. What do you think? Yes, of course. Because we share that love and John, like myself and like a lot of folks I know gravitates towards a poem that Whitman wrote called The Sleepers. Now, it's not exactly your 
Song of Myself Whitman. Um, it is it is definitely a darker Whitman, and it's a Whitman that permeates the dreams of uh, a lot of us that feel that Whitman was one of the first truly psychological poets. So I'm just going to open it up and allow Whitman to come into this space in our presence. And I'm gonna read the first few lines of The Sleepers to get us in the mood um, to talk to John. All right, The Sleepers, first published in the 1855, the first edition of Leaves of Grass and um, published throughout Whitman's career until the deathbed edition. I wander all night in my vision, stepping with light feet, swiftly and noiselessly stepping and stopping, bending with open eyes over the shut eyes of sleepers, wandering and confused, lost to myself, ill-assorted, contradictory, pausing, gazing, bending, and stopping. How solemn they look there, stretched and still. How quiet they breathe, the little children in their cradles. The wretched features of NUEs, the white features of corpses, the livid faces of drunkards, the sick gray faces of onanists, the gashed bodies on the battlefields, the insane in their strong doored rooms, the sacred idiots, the newborn emerging from gates and the dying emerging from gates. The night pervades them and enfolds them. The married couple sleep calmly in their bed, he with his palm on the hip of the wife, she with her palm on the hip of the husband. The sisters sleep lovingly side by side in their bed. The men sleep lovingly side by side in theirs. And the mother sleeps with her little child carefully wrapped. The blind sleep and the deaf and dumb sleep. The prisoner sleeps as well in the prison, the runaway son sleeps. The murder that is to be hung the next day, how does he sleep? And the murdered person, how does he sleep? The female that loves unrequited sleeps and the male that loves unrequited sleeps. The head of the money maker that plotted all day sleeps and the enraged and treacherous dispositions all, all sleep. I stand in the dark with drooping eyes by the worst suffering and the most restless. I pass my hands soothingly to and fro a few inches from them. The restless sink in their beds, they fitfully sleep. Now I pierce the darkness, new beings appear. The earth recedes from me into the night. I saw that it was beautiful and I see that what is not the earth is beautiful. I go from bedside to bedside. I sleep close with the other sleepers each in turn. I dream in my dream all the dreams of the other dreamers and I become the other dreamers. So John, I'm gonna stop there because I noticed that that is uh, an especially important moment in your work. Um, and I'm wondering if you can Tell us a little bit about the ways that Whitman has been in your life, how he's inspired you. And um, maybe we can get to the sleeping presidents, robust American love and, and so forth. But obviously this poem has, has shaped a lot of your imagination. Um, would you please tell us how, how Whitman came into your life? Well, what you read is for me, an extraordinary invitation to, uh, to explore the world of dreaming. Uh, not only do you have the, the mother and the father, you have bad people, you have children. And if you explore, invade their dreams, you can become those people. And what an extraordinary idea that by invading dreams, you not only are, can understand those dreams even more fully, but you become them from a vantage point you never had before. You become them. And I was just so taken with that. 
that um, after all, but it's it's a part of probably what I've been all my life mostly interested in, that ideas can become things. They can become objects so that words can, for me, trigger all kinds of, of representations. So that if I become this little girl tonight and I invade her dreams, imagine, imagine the choices that I have in representation. And alternatively, if I become the murderer and I'm in a prison, but I dream, so that there's a common humanity by way of Walt Whitman's poem that invites us to become almost anything we want. And um, this is what I did with my new book on sleeping presidents, um, because I'm very interested in dreaming. I'm interested in the bed that we all occupy as a very special place. Um, unlike anything else, when you think about it in life, this bed is where it witnesses the maybe the most seminal things in our life. We're born and we die. We're ill, we give birth, we make love, we dream. And so the bed has always been this special place where I've explored um, those opportunities that the bed provides. And I think it's the great equalizer too, right? I, I get the feeling that that's why Whitman goes for nighttime in this poem that everybody is, is really on the same level. And that list of the onanist, the murderer, the person that is murdered, I mean, everybody falls into this state. So to find a point of equilibrium amongst presidents from George Washington to Trump, that's no easy task. But I guess you start from that, right? That everyone sleeps. And from that point, you can invade, or I shouldn't say invade, but enter into their, um, into their beings. And I, I was curious about that because I read your introduction to sleeping presidents and you talk a lot about this idea of entering into other bodies. Can you clarify that for people who are unfamiliar with your art? Um, I'd go back to the word that you first used and then you, you substitute another. I like the idea of invading because um, the reason to invade is I think that when we dream, unlike our waking moments, we put on, uh, we take our masks off and in taking our masks off, uh, maybe we put other masks on. Um, and in the process, we can get inside somebody so quickly. After all, Walt has invited us to become these people that, who are dreaming. But, and I've had this happen. Uh, and in some strange and curious ways, um, scary ways, in taking on the dreams of other people, some people don't want you to be in their dreams. And then interestingly enough, or uninterestingly enough, a lot of people don't dream. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you open this door and you go into this person's life like in the presidents, there was only one president that didn't dream. I read that in the book. You don't think that Ford dreamt, huh? <laughs> what, what it, why was it? I, was it just something about his, his closure as a person that prevented you from entering that space? Do you have an hour? <laughs> we uh, do have an hour. We, um, that would be obviously psychologically I, I can respond by, by actually my own dream because what I do is I, I read about these people and I, um, so they're on my mind and I enter into this uh, sleepful state where I literally invade. Maybe you could say I knock on the door, I push it in, maybe I ring a bell. Um, and it's very interesting what happens. Um, people resist. Uh, some people I don't recognize because it's um, uh, they take on other dimensions um, and maybe there's nobody there. It's just a series of masks. I don't know enough. What I'm communicating in my art is where my dreams take me in the act of becoming the, the dreamer. Like he says, 
uh, Walt says, I dream in my dreams, all the dreams of the other dreamers, and I become the other dreamers. And I think that's the big invitation for me. That's the connection. So am I, am I dreaming crazy things? Is there a kind of truth here? It doesn't matter. I have found that I have, I have insights into certain people, uh, certain presidents that I never thought I would have by allowing myself, my dreams, invading their dreams, to shape the images that I paint. Now, I, I didn't think we would begin with the sleeping presidents, but I'm feeling inclined to show everyone the six images that um, we have available for view. Is that okay with you, John, if we take a look at those? And maybe by looking at them, you can clarify this position. I'm just gonna share my screen. And I'm in a dreamlike state now, so it, uh, I, it's not necessary to follow a certain strategy. Um, okay, fantastic. So as you see on my screen here, I have six of the images from uh, the Sleeping President series. Uh, should we begin with Zachary Taylor? I think that's kind of an intriguing point of entry. Well, nobody writes about Zachary Taylor. He was our 12th president and uh, he was a hero before the hero of the Mexican War, but he became a uh, president and did not live long, um, less than a year. So, uh, but what was intriguing when I invaded his dream, I didn't find him. He was absent. And instead, what was there was this horse. And I, I don't know whether horses dream or not, but this horse I communicated with. And what I first encountered was this extraordinary love that this horse named Whitey had for Zachary Taylor. And it was almost like um, the love of another human being. And um, I saw the relationship uh, very clearly, and I did a series of images. Um, this being one is an oil in which, um, for some reason, I made the horse a sort of idea or hobby horse uh, with a wheel. Um, the horse seemed, in a way, very real, and in a way, I was invading Taylor's dream. So I was occupying a very strange tightrope between what is maybe acceptable in everyday experience in waking moments and in unwaking moments. And so I wanted, I think that what comes through here, hopefully, is the conflict between the two. What strikes me very strongly is that his face is missing. Yes. Now in this portrait of a president, the, you would assume the central feature would be Zachary Taylor, but he's strangely absent. And instead I find myself very interested in the horse. Well, right? we have the horse's face, don't we? <laughs> exactly. We don't need the president's face, we have the horse. And just as I became Taylor, Taylor in his dream became the horse. So for some reason, I had a face for Taylor and it evaporated. Um, I had a body for the horse and that evaporated. And what was left was, I guess, the face of Whitey uh, that also was uh, coalesced with uh, the president. And these strange experiences um, uh, took place throughout all 45 presidents, except of course, Gerald Ford, uh, in which I, I hit a, a dead end. So, um, the, I don't know if people can see this, it's a very small watercolor, but it's uh, at the end of the dream, uh, Taylor and his horse are riding through, um, he has died and he's riding home, wherever that may be. And Chuck, he's riding above is, the, pardon me? Is this the second illustration yeah. here? Yes. Let me bring it up so people can see it. Yeah, he's riding as it were, um, moving beyond human reference. And somehow um, I, I, there are two suns. Um, the, the light is pervades and almost etherealizes the, the figures. 
Um, so in a way, it was a very happy dream because upon death, uh, he was reunited with his horse. And this is what this watercolor in this dream was about. And when I woke up, I felt this great joy, a great joy in a human being's death because of its new alignment um, with another living creature. And that's the only dream of the 45 dreams that involved an animal. Mm -hmm. uh, Teddy Roosevelt, I found myself sleepwalking. Um, I'd never sleepwalk. And I, I remember falling down a few stairs, literally. Uh, and his dream invited me. He was so restless. And if Walt is right, that I could become Teddy Roosevelt, well, it's appropriate that I would move as he moved, but I was unaccustomed. And we know that Teddy went throughout his house, constantly moving, constantly connecting, constantly aspiring, wanting to go to war. Unfortunately, there was no war, or maybe fortunately in some ways, there was no war during his administration. So, mm -hmm. I, I don't know these pieces that well because this is a new project for me. Um, I find them absolutely gorgeous and I'm kind of overwhelmed by the amount of uh, research and work that must have gone into this volume just on all 45 presidents. So can you tell us a little bit, I mean, did you actually research on each of them? I would assume that you did, right? You have to know something about their lives to actually share that space. That yeah, I, uh, I, I, uh, I read a lot. I, I like to read and I'm very receptive to what I read. And when I get an idea as an example of uh, a man's love for a horse and how uh, the horse uh, became very important to him and how he did not want the horse to be embalmed before he died mm -hmm. because they needed to ride off together. Well, that was what the series on Zachary Taylor was all about. And there's very little written about Zachary Taylor. He's not very interesting, but I found him fascinating because I invaded his dream. Well, I think what really is impressive besides the artistry itself is the, the thought. I mean, this is, this is uh, your work is considered. And, and with Whitman, I know this very well because you and I have worked on this together, but you have read so much Whitman in order to prepare for meeting him in this artistic space. So can you, can you talk about that a bit? I mean, how does an artist uh, like you encounter Walt Whitman? Um, and why, why choose Whitman to represent him visually in art? And I guess part of this answer, I'm thinking of, you know, a few weeks ago, we had Brian Selznick on the show who also talked about representing Whitman's visions through art. And Whitman has this great history of appealing to visual artists. Um, maybe you can help us understand that. I mean, what is it about the poetry that so draws in someone who, who, who wants to paint? Well, uh, for 25 years, I lived in lower Manhattan, um, not far from Matthew Brady's studio and uh, P.T. Barnum's uh, palace of uh, grotesques. And um, I, at one time, apparently there was a, uh, a museum of Egyptology called Dr. Abbott's. And I think we are pretty certain that Walt visited there. And we Absolutely. even know the objects, which are now in the Brooklyn Museum, um, which he loved. And um, there was a, a, a connection between Walt and Egypt. And interestingly, um, I, I admired Walt Whitman, but he was never important to me until I went to Egypt. And I went to Egypt uh, to see the monuments and um, that was about near 2000. And um, going there, I found that I wanted to return. And somehow I felt this connection, this uh, it's almost a, a past life connection, like I had lived there before. 
And so I was determined to return and I did about 2000, the year 2000. Um, and uh, then I began to, um, it was very lonely there. There weren't a lot of people to talk to. Um, I would import people um, and uh, they would last 10 days or so. And then I would uh, be left with the Egyptians and they were mostly interested in other things. Um, and finally, um, uh, I started at, particularly at night, reading uh, Leaves of Grass. Actually, it was the edition that uh, you edited, uh, uh, Karen. So, uh, and um, it was interesting because I've always done watercolors and I felt the need to write on the watercolors. Why? It seemed that, that the images were not enough, that they needed another dimension beyond the colors or the spaces, beyond the, um, uh, the, the papyrus, which I was working on. So I started writing on the papyrus. I started uh, coordinating, like somehow the images suggested um, what uh, uh, ways of thinking or talking about the objects that were portrayed. And then I began to reverse it. I began to write down things, which immediately, better for me, elicited uh, these wonderful choices visually of colors and shapes and subjects. So again, I was, uh, through the use of uh, ideas, I made things, I made objects that were all around me, whether it was the Egyptian sun, which is magnificent, or trees or sand, the Nile itself. Um, er everything in Egypt is so lacking in measurement. It, everything is immeasurable. And I love the idea of portraying what could not or should not be portrayed because how do you calculate its measurement? And so after a while, I wanted to read these uh, comments that I wrote. I wanted to read them aloud. And then in time, I wanted to uh, have other people read them. And so that led me to theater and to film. And um, none of the boundaries that I had always respected were, um, applicable anymore. So I'm really interested in this idea that you began reading Whitman in Egypt mm -hmm. uh, because he's considered the America's poet, but you had to leave in order to really discover him. Mm -hmm. And it was there, I guess, because you had enough personal space, right? As you said, it was lonely, but there was something about reading Whitman that brought you to a point of connection. And that watercolor series, Robust American Love, is it grounded in that? Is that where those paintings began? Yes, all of those paintings, it was a series uh, on papyrus in Egypt, I think between 2004 and say 2007, in which I began more and more exploring, reading Whitman uh, and applying uh, the feelings and the imagery, uh, making them things. Uh, I love the physicality of papyrus, which as many of you might know, it consists of reeds that are split and flattened and then applied uh, color and um, from the sap of the uh, acacia tree, we call it gum Arabic. And so there's a great physicality in Egypt. And I tried to approximate that. But again, like I was talking about, um, I didn't go to Egypt um, uh, really alone, because once I got there, I discovered Walt Whitman reading, but I also felt his energy. And when I read this about becoming the, the, uh, the dreamer, I started to become him. And I started to explore some of the poems in my own head at night, and, I, and he was there. So um, it wasn't Dr. Abbott's Egyptian Museum anymore, it was uh, Luxor. Uh, the Valley of the Kings. It was uh, the Book of the Dead. It was Hatshepsut. Uh, it was Karnak Temple, all those things, all of which he was interested in. And I remember he pined, he wished he could go there because I think the vision of the Egyptians and his own vision of the eternal return, I think that was all part of him. So I, I, um, I encountered a friend uh, in Egypt. And um, 
So I did another series I think you've not seen. <clears throat> and it's called uh, uh, um, uh, With Walt in Egypt. And um, so it's a kind of direct conversation. Well, I know when we were talking about doing this exhibition in Brooklyn, that there were many more watercolors than we picked for the show, right? We had 30 of these, as we call them now, Robust American Love, this series. And we divided those 30 into groups of 10. So you have the Robust American Love series, which is really about the public declaration of love as power. And then there was also the In Paths Untrodden series, the 10 images that explored love uh, that was much more in, in an intimate setting rather than a public declaration. And then finally, uh, Fluid as Nature, which was a series of 10 images of love beyond traditional boundaries, ways in which Whitman was very experimental about the idea of love. So how many paintings were there how many did you do in Toto, John? I know we have just the 30 in the series, but how many, how many works on Whitman have you done? Do you have a number? I, I, don't, I don't really know, um, a couple hundred. Um, I was there for 10 years. I left in 2011 after the, uh, when Mubarak fell uh, and all of a sudden it got sort of dangerous in 2011, April. Um, and I would do, uh, 10 years, maybe I would do 50, 50 a year. Mind you, I, I was only three months of the year in Egypt. I went to Egypt when uh, New York's weather was nasty. So I was there December, January, and February. And so maybe I did 50, so I did maybe 500. Well, I know you are a prolific artist and these watercolors are absolutely exquisite. So I'm just gonna share my screen so that folks can get a look at some of them. And I am have up here on my screen, the 10 we selected for the Robust American Love series. And I guess it's only fitting to show the one that so inspired everybody at the Whitman Initiative. So uh, a, a beautiful image of a heart looking very patriotic with a little bit of an edge. And beneath that, you see John's handwriting to remain to teach robust America love. Now, uh, the Whitmanites out there might say, wait a second, <laughs> that's, that's not a exact quotation. Um, Whitman actually wrote to remain to teach robust American love. And I know, John, that your understanding and interpretation of Whitman is very subtle here. Um, you're actually changing the meaning of the line in a really interesting way, right? Instead of teaching a type of a love that's typically American, you've changed it to that America actually needs to learn more about love. Well, um, it's not a, an exact quote and it, it could well be that when I wrote that, I made a mistake. Um, I don't know. Um, it, well, it's a pretty happy mistake. Yeah, I would say that. And, and that's something I feel like is really interesting, especially for those out there that are, uh, that know Whitman by heart, that you change, you know, subtly change some of the quotations to be in some ways even more contemporary and relevant and timely. Uh, I think that's the reason that so many of us gravitated towards this particular one. Um, in addition to the beautiful patriotic feeling of, of that heart. Um, but the way in which you know Whitman so well, you can actually become his modern spokesperson. Um, yeah. because uh, I was dreaming and uh, he let me in. I invaded and he was responding and uh, uh, the next day, I would I would paint all of these outside, and so um, I wrote out what I remembered, and um, maybe he was editing through me. I have no idea. Um, in a, in a way, um, on the most common level, I made a mistake. On a more elevated level, um, 
he was known to revise a lot. He was revising through me. Uh, I don't want to be arrogant, nor do I want to be unduly humble, but um, this is what resulted. That's so fantastic because Whitman is the poet of revision. He never stopped revising. And I guess traditionally, of course, scholars assume that when he dies, the revision stopped. But as an artist, you're telling us that the revision continues through other voices, including your own. Well, uh, just like Zachary Taylor, uh, everyone said, well, you love Whitey the horse so much. Why don't you embalm him? And he said no, and uh, because Whitey continued to live even after Whitey died, because he lived in Zachary Taylor's mind. And so when Taylor died, he met the horse, and then they flew in the heavens and were reunited. And so in a way, I guess, if you invade somebody's dream, life doesn't stop. There are no periods, (laughs) but everything is continuous. Beautiful. It actually sounds like Whitman to me. <laughs> oh, what, what is that quote from Song of Myself? All goes onward and outward and nothing collapses. And to die is far different than anyone expects and luckier, right? Because of that continuity. He had a really Eastern or one might say Egyptian vision of the cycles of life. Um, and I feel like you bring this up so beautifully in the work that you do. Um, I'm looking at the 10 again, and I love all of them, obviously, because I curated these 10 to be together as this public declarative statement of love. I'm just going to pick one of the favorites of the folks that would come to the exhibition. And this is a really provocative moment in Song of Myself, actually. Um, And I think on the side here, we have, um, you know, the, the transcription. So if, if, the viewers out there have trouble reading the script so small, you can see what, what's actually written. But this is this famous, uh, almost uh, 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 sometimes described as sort of the oral sex moment in Song of Myself, where Whitman talks about rolling over, I mind how we lay in June, such a transparent summer morning, you settled your head athwart my hips and gently turned over upon me. So a very intimate moment and some which is sometimes read as also a a union of body and soul or you know some sort of spiritual uh uh uh, jubilant moment for for whitman in song of myself and what you do with your interpretation is you bring a political sense right you're you're sort of bringing a patriotic sense to this celebration can you can you comment on the illustration and its relationship to this passage um did i change the meaning at all no no you didn't do i need to tell you that (laughs) no you were you're you're spot on with the way that i think about this part um i just find it you know just beautifully provocative and then to see the stars and stripes on the two figures here that are just joyously celebrating love. I mean, I think you're reclaiming the idea of love as something very powerful and American and love in all forms, right? Um, you know, not just the traditional forms of love, uh, but, but as Whitman did, love, love also, whatever it is, homosexual, heterosexual, whatever you might call it, um, it finds a, a joyous moment of celebration in Whitman's poetry. Uh, The only thing I could say is that in most of the works that you selected, uh, somehow they all included the theme of being American. And um, stars frequently are are repeated over and over and stripes. And it's obvious in this one. And I can never tell you, um, because I don't remember, and I can't tell from looking at it now um, where this came from. But I would, when I look at it, uh, and it's, um, it's many years ago that I did this, um, uh, I would say that the stars and the stripes were very important because in some sense, it, it had a much larger political meaning, as you say. And it's, um, 
how we can make love and how we can make war. And certainly war, uh, civil war was certainly on the minds of people, mm -hmm. but that uh, when two people can make love and they can encourage one another to be um, intoxicated with one another, I, I think those are the qualities that I was after in this. And uh, I didn't want to make it so graphic, but I noticed that in some sense, the placement of the figures, yes. But I contrast green grass and blue sky, and they're the dividing line between the two. It's just beautiful. I think Walt would, would so approve of the use of his words in this way, right? It, it's totally joyous and, and um, I guess representational, but there's this abstract interpretive quality to it that makes it just so fun to explore these pieces. Um, let's see, maybe just because I see that we've only got 15 minutes left, I'm gonna take folks to In Paths Untrodden. And we've got a series here also of images. These, as you can even see by the palette, explore a more intimate place. Um, and uh, I think there are quite a few that are taken actually from the sleepers, particular moments in that poem, um, such as uh, the one that I was looking at before, um, before we started the show. And let me just put the transcription up here. Uh, this is from a passage in the sleepers that's a little bit beyond what I read, a very cryptic passage. You don't know exactly what's happening, but Whitman feels like he's in transition between bodies, right? He becomes a, a woman, then he becomes another lover and he imagines yet another lover. Uh, and then he starts talking to this power he calls darkness. Darkness, you are gentler than my lover. His flesh was sweaty and panting. I feel the hot moisture he left me. So a very um, moody, emotional moment in the poem. And I guess, can I ask you how you chose the selection that you did? I mean, was it just parts of poems that really seemed visually representational to you? Or was there just, was there another quality to the quotations that you used? Because I noticed, John, um, as, as anybody would who knows Whitman, your knowledge of Whitman is really demonstrated by the quotations that are not just from poems like Song of Myself and the Sleepers, they're from letters, they're from uh, obscure sources, notebooks, transcripts. So you obviously have dug very deep into his work and you had a lot to choose from. Like why choose a passage like this? Well, um, I was there for almost 11 years and I, would, uh, I had the poet with me and um, I would read um, from the beginning of the 1855 Leaps of Grass to the end and then I would read other poems, I would read letters. I don't know, that's such a hard question to answer. What, what made me do on this day you know, May of uh, 2007 or right. whatever. Why would I do that? I don't know. I, I guess what I was left with is the feeling of, of blackness, darkness. And, uh, but there was a redemptive quality at the same time. We were, we were never overwhelmed. And maybe it's the Thales that I marked. Um, the figure is like exhausted and supine, but there, it also moves up. No pun intended. Um, so I don't know where that came from, other than if I wanted to be romantic, I could say, well, Walt inspired me. Um, that was a maybe a very lonely day. and But I do know that I felt all of these things. By reading three or four poems a day, I, the, the, the impact would be cumulative. And so maybe by the end of the week, I would I'd have so many images that I would let the images out and let them speak. But they were preceded always by that part of the poem, which, as you pointed out, sometimes I would change or I would edit and I made them my own. Um, it's always hard to go back and 
And what was that day? You know, maybe it was, well, it never rained in Egypt, but maybe it was a, a, a stormy, windy day and I felt the darkness. I don't know. Did you, I, I wanted to ask a practical question. Did you just keep a notebook of the passages that you found very special and then eventually got to artworks about them? Or what was the process like? Did you start with the quotation or did you begin with the painting? Oh, I started with the quotation and I would read and then I would mark it. And then I did, you're not seeing the, some of the failures some of the ones that were unrealized, I got rid of those, but um, some of them, um, uh, I started with the quote and frequently the quote was much longer than I wanted. I noticed this one, number five on the top um, is much longer. I tried to be economical about how much to say and I did not want to be uh, long-winded and so uh, I started with the quote and immediately I got these images and then I went with it. And, um, and I, I was in Egypt at that time. And so it, I felt that uh, accumulation of what? Of spirit, of energy, something that he admired. And these were not, we were not in a museum. We were in the actual place, the source of his uh, fascination with this country. And so um, um, we, uh, it, it was about America and yet interestingly it was about Egypt. And those two are not contradictory. I find that there's real magic in so many of these. This is one of my favorites as you know. Uh, and from a poem that I'm gonna forget now, is it, Passage to India was also another poem I'm less familiar with, but I was so moved by this semi-abstract depiction of the quotation, for the deep waters only, reckless O soul exploring, I with thee and thou with me, for we are bound where mariner has not yet dared to go, and we will risk the ship, ourselves and all. What a fantastic quotation and one that does not is not familiar to me it's not one of the big Whitman moments but you've brought it out and with this delicate hand that you have underneath that and this absolutely beautiful deep watercolor you can feel the water rush over you when you look at this I mean John some of these uh, I, I'm amazed at how how close you're getting to to Whitman in these, or at least what I imagine Whitman is, right? They dimensionalized Whitman to me in such a, a really powerful way. Well, I had a lot of help. You mean Walt was there? I hope. <laughs> I definitely get that feeling. Um, and before we run out of time, I wanted to show everyone also from Fluid as Nature, which are, um, the images that we have decided are about love beyond traditional boundaries. Um, a lot of these are much more abstract than the other two series. And maybe this one was a really popular one when we had the exhibition. Lots of people stopped and looked at this. Uh, I ate with you and slept with you. Your body has become not yours only, nor left my body mine only. And you have here, this is definitely one of your more abstract pieces. I'm just sorry, I can't do it justice on my screen here. Um, but can you, can you offer us a few words on, you know, how, why you went from representational to almost totally abstract, right? I do see two green legs. You know, I see kind of a body here, um, maybe the innards of a body. Uh, but there's coloration that's quite, you know, unnatural, I would think, for depicting a, a realistic form. Um, and it looks, uh, it looks like a, an, an abstract painting. You know, I'm reminded of, um, I don't know, Matisse or, or somebody like that. Um, well, any excuse me. I was just going to say, if, if your body is not your own, what does it look like? Mm. That again, invites you to consider your body with colors that 
are not flesh colored, are uh, organs that you can be rearranged, that love overpowers so the heart can become enlarged. Um, when your body is not your own, it's not a loss, but a gain. And that's what I think this uh, poem and this image hopefully uh, approximates that uh, it's this uh, way much like a dream of you're moving outside normal limits. Hmm. And these normal limits are limiting. And, um, but if somebody loves us and they love our body, then we don't own it. And in fact, we can imagine what, how do they see our body? What a wonderful opportunity to explore how a lover sees his lover's body. And that's what I tried to do here. Wow, that's just magnificent. And you're right, I, I can see things that are not normally where they you, where where we think they are and yet this has it doesn't have a feeling of um uh being disembodied or something it's it's very joyous you know it's it still has such a for me a good feeling even though the body doesn't look like it's really put together as it should be uh it there's is serious, isn't it? it's uh it might disintegrate. Right. Doesn't love do that sometimes? It'll disintegrate our body. Um, it, it can create an explosion, particularly when our body is not our own. When someone loves our body or admires our body and takes makes claim on our body, then I think that what happens is something um, which maybe at times we don't recognize the overwhelming power of love to change us or to make us something that we're not, maybe something we don't wanna be, the wrong kind of love. Um, but it's, um, yeah, I'm looking at this, I haven't looked at this in quite a while and I think I wanted it to be recognized as a body, but after that, I wanted it to blow it up, you know, create an explosion. I mean, the stomach and, I don't know if those are sexual organs. Look at the heart and there's a nipple. But look at the arm, it's truncated. Again, I don't know the reasons why, but it, you work until you're satisfied or you do as best you can and then you put it aside. Well, I had a, um, a teacher, Richard Diebenkorn, uh, who was a, a, a absolutely wonderful artist, uh, not, a so, not so good teacher, but through his work, uh, he got us to do many watercolors or drawings, maybe like 20 in a period of 10 minutes. And while that seemed, might seem like a great burden, it was wonderful because it invited us to trust our instinct, our intuition. Mm -hmm. So put it down. Don't worry about it. It's a little sloppy. Fine. That's part of the subject. And if you feel inspired by a poem that you have read 10 minutes ago, uh, it's a wonderful training or background to not question where these ideas or colors come from. Beautiful, beautiful thoughts that can be also brought over to the world of literature too. And I see what time it is. I, I just want to get to maybe one more. And I happen to really love this one. Maybe this is a, a neat place to, to close. And I, when I met you, mean to discover you by the like in you. And I'm going to try to bring this to the viewers out there. We have uh, two faces that seem to be conjoined, right? Two, two beings and ma making up themselves into one thing. And I, I love how this is one of those works of art that if I look at it a long time, I see a full profile in either of them, right? So it doesn't seem to me that either is suffering from this union, but they actually have more from the union themselves and more. Um, well, you have your lover's body and the lover has your body and so you can't own it and you can't demarcate it. So when you kiss, um, maybe the idea that your lover's lips remain with you, if not the actual lips, maybe the memory of lips or the taste 
this is what I was trying to, it was like an exchange of energy or an exchange of certain senses um, of sight and, you know, and touch and smell. It's interesting that when you kiss, there is such an exchange of all the senses and you take on someone else's. That's what I was after. Absolutely beautiful, John. Um, I want to thank you for being on the show. I learned actually a lot and I, I am quite familiar with these pieces. So excited about Sleeping Presidents and I'm going to put in my pre-order on Amazon for that book coming out by John in January. John, any last thoughts? Is there, I don't know, a uh, something that you want to leave us with, something to think about uh, that we can carry with us, especially during this time of, uh, we've been talking so much about the senses and sensual pleasure. And here we are in a, in a moment where we can't reach out and touch each other. Um, is there something that we can carry away uh, that you can offer us? I think that we uh, must never be afraid of our dreams that our dreams can be a wonderful way of touching another human being, of getting to know that other person. And I think that um, um, in encountering uh, another person's dream, there's a huge responsibility and a responsibility uh, where of honesty. And uh, I, I find that Walt's invitation to invade, to become that dreamer is one of the most marvelous things that we can do as, as human beings, particularly now when we are so detached from one another. But we can still dream. We can still dream, absolutely. John Ransom Phillips, it's an honor to speak with you. I absolutely adore your work and I have to thank you for uh, coming to Robust American Love, named after your own work. <laughs> we're, we're very, very happy to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Karen. Okay, and thank you everyone out there for listening in. Please join us next Thursday and the next Thursday after that. And uh, take care, we will see you then. <laughs>